Our objective is to highlight how diverse partners can work together to address the challenges of climate change and resilience. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the benefits potentially through that, that type of model of partnership, um, as well as some of the difficulties and challenges, and then looking forward some of the opportunities that we see uh, coming down the road. Um, but before um, uh, we get started and dive in, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to just briefly introduce themselves. Uh, their names, uh, what they do, um, and uh, then we'll, we'll get started. I'll make a few opening remarks and have a few questions for the panelists. Joyce, do you want to start? Yes, hi. My name is Joyce Coffey, and I'm the managing director of the University of Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index. We're the world's leading index showing which countries are best prepared to deal with climate disruption, urbanization, natural resource constraints, and other global shifts. And the intention of the index is to really increase the uptake in both the corporate and the development spheres for adaptation decision making that save lives and improve livelihoods. Um, we are a program of the Environmental Change Initiative within the University of Notre Dame. Um, hi, my name is Michael Cody. I am a climate adaptation specialist for um, International Resources Group, which is a subsidiary of Angility Corporation here in Alexandria, Virginia, um, just south of DC, as everyone knows. Um, I am a program manager for um, a very large USAID contract called the Climate Change Resilient Development Contract. It's USAID's largest adaptation contract. It, it uh, does research and policy decision making um, and capacity building in 30 countries around the world, so I'm, I fly a lot. Um, and um, I also am a technical specialist on two programs in of those 30 countries. Um, in Nepal, I help um, the government with something called Goloths. Goloths are glacial lake outburst floods, which um, are basically, in a very, very quick nutshell, glacial glaciers are melting really, really fast in the Himalayan mountains and also the Andes in Peru. And they're leaving behind these very large lakes. And they're happen these are happening very rapidly around the world. And these lakes are quite dangerous because they're held together just by basically rocks and a little bit of sand and gravel. And when the lakes get big enough, they uh, tend to um, flood downstream communities. So we're working with the UN, USAID, um, to prevent those types of um, floods from impacting um, local economies, communities, uh, electric grid systems, because there's a lot of hydropower that's involved. Um, and the tourism sector. And that's just one project out of 30. Um, so I'm a technical specialist on that. And I just so happen to also be uh, the communications director for the entire contract. So I wear many hats, and um, I'm quite busy. Hi there. My name is Robert Foster. I'm with the Aspen Institute. Uh, on the note of GLOFs, I've got an acronym too, AMP. And that stands for Accelerating Market Driven Partnerships. Uh, such a cute acronym, uh, you probably might guess, was started at the State Department. We were actually launched by Secretary Clinton a couple of years ago. And the concept that she had when she launched us is, in an era of diminishing government resources, how can we partner with the private sector in order to generate development outcomes, uh, one of which is addressing climate change. Our current focus uh, at the moment is on impact technologies, and this is we're defining these as technologies that disproportionately benefit underserved communities. And believe it or not, there's a lot of ways that that links back to climate, which we could talk about. And uh, we are uh, very much excited to be here, and thank you for the opportunity. Hi, everybody. I'm Maureen Johnson. I'm the Global Internal Sustainability Manager for Deloitte. Uh, by internal, uh, that is just Deloitte lingo, lingo meaning non-client facing, although I used to work in client services. Um, technically, I work for Deloitte Tushimatsu Limited, uh, also is the central entity for Deloitte, so we also have our interesting lingo as well. <laughs> and I was hoping to come here and plug our global annual impact report that was coming out today. and. Uh, not quite, but stay tuned, check <laughs> Deloitte.com, maybe tomorrow, maybe Monday, almost there. Great. And the GRI report, our UN Global Compact, Communication on Progress. Great. 
And my name again is David Leagy. I'm Director of University Engagement and Research at Catholic Relief Services, uh, CRS, uh, in Baltimore, not too far away from here. Um, I work actually very closely with Notre Dame, um, which is one of our uh, closer university partners. Um, and uh, it's a partnership that has gone back probably at least 15 years, if not longer. That started initially with the uh, Kroc Institute uh, for Peacebuilding and has expanded to include the Business School, um, the Eck Institute for Global Health, and a number of other different uh, collaborations across the university. Um, it's been a great experience for us in terms of learning about how to do uh, partnerships with a diverse set of partners um, outside of our own NGO sector, outside of our comfort zone, in effect. So there's been a lot of learning through that experience. So I'm going to start with just a few um, opening remarks, um, just to kind of frame the conversation a little bit. Um, and I wanted to start with uh, one that I think was uh, quite significant. I was in DC um, last month uh, for the Frontiers and Development event. Perhaps some of you also had the opportunity to participate in that. It's uh, something that uh, USAID has organized for a couple years in a row, uh, just ahead of all the New York uh, UN meetings, um, uh, which occur the following week. Um, and one of the themes that I think came out uh, both um, uh, here in DC as well as the next week in New York was the convergence of uh, development and climate change agendas. Um, in the past, those had sort of almost been viewed separately. Um, and I think there's growing awareness of the need to really uh, understand better the nexus between poverty reduction on the one hand um, and climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation. And there's a tremendous opportunity actually next year with the finalization of the new sustainable development goals, which will, I guess, replace the Millennium De Development Goals. Um, and then the Paris uh, Climate Change uh, Agreement uh, that will be under negotiation. And the opportunity to link those two together much more uh, intentionally and to think about poverty reduction and climate change together. Um, I think that's quite significant. Um, equally significant, I think, is another type of convergence. And that is something that I think we've already talked about quite a bit here today, and that is uh, the, the growing realization that a diverse set of partners can't continue to work in their own silos on their own. They need to actually come together and work together and benefit from the synergies that will come from uh, the various capacities and resources that they bring to the table. Um, and I think this will be particularly interesting to explore, to explore in the context of uh, climate change and resilience, uh, which is a topic of the panel. Um, we talked about the Global Development Lab earlier. I think that's one manifestation of this, um, but I think we see it more broadly also uh, outside of USAID. Um, another important trend that I wanted to note is the focus of a lot of donors on resilience. Uh, it's a bit of a buzzword, yes, um, but I think what's important behind that is a recognition that we need to build capacity of people, communities, nations, organizations to better um, deal with uh, the impact of climate change, to somehow limit the impact of it if possible, and also to allow people to bounce back better um, when that impact does occur. Um, I think that's quite important in the context of also looking at the role that data and information uh, can play in helping us to make decisions. I mean, that brings me to my, my next point, which is the growing use of, of ICT for development. We heard that acronym used in the last panel. Um, but I think we could go even further and, and, and be more specific to, to say big data, um, predictive analytics, trying to use that in a way to, to develop better um, uh, programs that are more targeted towards specific needs. Um, and I, one example that I would use from, from our own work at CRS is we do a lot of work on climate mapping, looking at how smallholder farmers will be impacted by climate change. Uh, what's going to happen to the, the temperature, to precipitation? What kind of crops will they no longer be able to grow? How will they need to adapt in the future? Um, and that brings me to my last point, which is the emergence of climate smart agriculture as an important response um, in the context of uh, helping people to adapt to, to the impact of climate change. And I think it, it actually nicely illustrates the linkage between, as I was talking earlier, poverty reduction, and you could add in food security, uh, as well as climate change mitigation and adaptation. So with those points, um, I want to open up the discussion a little bit. And um, I'm going to start out with Michael. And um, I'd like, if you could, Michael, if you, um, you could talk a little bit about some of these cross-sector partnerships, the diverse partners, private sector, universities, NGOs, governments, et cetera. 
talk about, in your experience, where have these been successful? Give us maybe an example or two. What are some of the, the resources and capacities that the different partners have brought to the table, the different roles that they've played in a complementary way? Sure. Um, thanks for uh, putting me on the spot so early in the discussion. But um, um, so maybe, maybe I'll go back to uh, this, this one program. And again, I'm on one contract for USAID, and there's, there's 30 different um, sub projects that we do. But I'll go back to this one that I led off with earlier, which is the, the GLOF project in, in Nepal. It's also in Peru. Um, we, we're here in DC. So we're program managers. We're based in DC. And what we, we are required to partner with researchers and um, experts who are in the field and on the ground that can do the work uh, that's required in a Nepal context. So we had to, so again, let me just back up a little bit. Uh, uh, this, this issue with glacial lake outburst floods, these GLOFs, what, what that, what require, what's required to figure out where a GLOF is, is um, both satellite data from um, National Space Institute. So we work with uh, uh, not only NASA, but also um, the Japan um, Space Institute. Um, because they have satellites that focus on South Asia, of course. Um, so that's, that's one. We have to work at a very, very high global level. Um, locally, we have to get permission from the Nepali government themselves to actually do scientific research to figure out where these GLOFs are and how dangerous they are, because we're going to send in some scientists, um, which I'll get to in a second, who they are. Um, we have to send in scientists to actually go and visit these lakes um, in these glaciers and set up equipment um, to basically monitor the rate of, um, I guess, the, the rate of depletion, um, how fast these lakes are growing, um, and do different types of actual physical survey work, which is quite dangerous. Um, hiking into the Himalaya Mountains is probably one of the most dangerous adventures a human can take, I think. Um, so there's that, working with uh, the national government to get the scientists in, and then getting actually the researchers um, who have not only the, um, the, the tech technical acumen, but also the strength, the physical strength to do this kind of work, um, is very, very highly specialized. So we worked with, um, we, we identified um, University of Texas, Austin. There's a Dr. Um, Dane McKinney. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of uh, Dr. McKinney, but He's a water engineer, um, and he's also strong enough to go trekking in the Himalayan mountains. Um, and then we also partnered with an NGO um, in West Virginia called the Mountain Institute. Um, that's directed by um, Dr. Alton Byers. And he has been working in Nepal and the Himalayas for nearly 40 years. Um, he helped set up Nepal's first national park um, in the mid-'90s. Um, so we identified those two uh, partners to help us um, figure out how to measure these glacial lakes. And then we had to um, figure out who was at risk. So once these, once these lakes are identified in the Himalayan mountains, who and the downstream communities are at risk from these potential floods? So if you can imagine, um, say the floor is just the, the, you know, where all the cities are, the Himalayan mountains are not just these small little mountains. And they're, they're not just kind of on a slope like this. They're extremely tall, and they're very, very steep slopes. And when a, when a glof bursts, when, a, when one of these lakes bursts, they go down these mountains. And they actually gain speed, and they gain debris, and they gain water. So they actually get bigger as they go downstream, unlike an avalanche, which kind of slows down this water gets faster. So what that means is we had to figure out who in these communities, which villages were at risk, which electric grids, because there are all these microgrids that are on the side of these mountains, which, which grids are at risk, which schools are at risk. Um, there's also a lot of cultural, um, cultural sites, because it's a very religious country. So um, there are lots of very, very, very important shrines. Some of them are not known to the public. So we had to actually work with the local communities to find out which of those shrines um, were at risk as well. 
So within that context, um, we had to um, partner with, because we didn't have all the funding for this um, very complex project, um, we partnered with um, the UNDP, who had um, a very robust network of um, public-private partnerships um, and existing MOUs with the government of Nepal who work in the Himalayan mountains and also in some of the parks. So we partnered with them to figure out um, where these most vulnerable communities are, work with them, use um, some type of collaborative approaches um, to reduce their, their risk from these, these GLOFs. And then at the end of this, um, this project, um, the scientists, because there's 11 scientists in total, um, they're, they're publishing, I think now they're up to about 12 peer-reviewed articles based on this, and this is in just three years. Um, and there's three videos, there's a community of practice for people who want to do work, adaptation work in uh, the High Mountain regions. It's called the uh, High Mountain Adaptation Partnership, HIMAP. Um, and then finally, the UN um, agreed that one of the lakes that we identified at the bottom of Mount Everest, called Imja Lake, was indeed, or is indeed, one of the most dangerous lakes in the world. And just very briefly, um, this lake didn't exist about 15 years ago. It was literally just a glacier. It was called Imja Glacier. It melted, um, and it's about two miles long. That's a huge lake. It's probably the biggest glacial lake in the world right now. Um, and it's growing every year. And it threatens about 150,000 people right now. So the UN said, OK, this is a problem based on what my scientists told them. And they f they kicked in, they're kicking in now uh, $10 million to reduce the lake through some engineering projects and also plug in a small electric hydro dam. So that's one example of how we partnered with uh, very, very specialized NGOs, universities, um, and then high-level donors um, and had a success on a resilience project in Nepal. Great example, thanks. Does anyone else have an example that they'd like to share of one of these partnerships? I'll give a quick plug. I can't help it. Um, <laughs> Deloitte partnered with USAID um, to lower barriers for financing in Indonesia. And um, you know they worked with local uh, financing um, to make it easier for power purchasing agreements. They created a uh, knowledge transfer um, with the financing, financing institutions. That would be Deloitte Speak. Maybe Notre Dame Speak would be teaching them to fish. Um, so it would be an ongoing benefit in the future. And then obviously the benefit for Indonesia, which is such an increasing economy and population, would be you know, strengthening resilience. And then another interesting but local partnership that I think, um, it's not governmental, but I think it has a, a benefit that could be transferable, is something called Recycle Bank here. Um, and it's, it works with local municipalities to incentivize carrot style recycling, um, air miles, you know, so people get um, points for recycling. And have you heard of it? And so like Philadelphia, you know, increased their recycling rate from like 7% to 90% within months. And people get points that they can then redeem at Macy's. Okay, granted, you don't want to encourage our kind of consumerism maybe in other areas. But, um, but that concept of what's in it for me, I always you know, test this concept out with people at Deloitte who aren't really of the same kind of mindset as I am. Um, and it works. <laughs> you know? And that's when I know it will work other places. Um, and it saves money. It's like a win for the company. They take a cut of recycling revenues. It's a win for retailers. Like, all they need to do is get somebody in the store. Like, you think I'm really just going to buy one pair of earrings? Um, it's a win for the municipalities. They, like Hollywood, Florida, you know, saved uh, half a million dollars in waste disposal fees and, you know, gained a quarter million in, in recycling revenue. 
And you know, so it's like a win-win-win all around. And you know, if you could take that concept, but then make the incentives something that strengthens resilience, you know, like public transportation or green transportation or points for um, small package uh, uh, medications or school uniforms. You know, I think that would be an, an interesting challenge, an opportunity. Great examples, thank you. Um, Robert, I'm gonna direct the next question sure. to you. Um, in your work, how do you measure success with cross-sector partnerships that address climate change and resilience? you have some examples? Sure, well, maybe I could frame it out a little bit and, and just build on what Michael and Maureen have said. Uh, when we're trying to deal with something as complicated as resilience, uh, these are very complex systems, and a traditional business or government approach, or even a nonprofit approach, often isn't sufficient to, to solve for this. Hence the partnerships and P3 and the 16 other names that we have for them. And uh, they're really tough. They're really, really hard. Uh, there's a colleague uh, that I was speaking, or an ex-colleague, uh, who's now in private equity, and he was talking about the nonprofit sector. And he's like, you know, it's just so complicated in the nonprofit world because the motivations are so opaque. Uh, which I thought was an interesting comment. Uh, but but I think the, the point is that we come from very different cultures, and when they come together, especially with something as complicated as what, what you're tackling, Michael, it's, it's, it's really hard. And we've learned a few lessons. We've had some spectacular failures, and I feel that those are often better to describe uh, than we happen to have this one that was successful. Um, but there are, I'd say, three learnings that, that I, I would like just to dive into very briefly here. Uh, that we've had. One is around transparency, another is around commitment, and a third is around metrics. And these all seem very broad and bland, I know, but actually uh, it's, it's worth, worth thinking about them. So first, uh, around transparency, having clear motivations from the outset and all partners are there uh, generally comes pretty easy in a business mindset because the, the objective is very, very much in common uh, with the whole firm, maximize shareholder value. Uh, but when we start to bring in the interests of a community and a value chain for a corporation and a governance perspective, it gets more complicated. So to get that very clear out on the table early on is awesome. Uh, another one is around commitment. Uh, what we found here in Washington is most government service lasts about 18 months and people are out. Uh, and same thing with contractors. They, some, some will be in for the long haul for several years. But having a commitment from the individual, if, certainly if he or she is at a high level, and having a commitment from an institution to carry on an intense partnership beyond political cycles, I think is also very critical. And three, and this would be most important, we always talk about metrics, and, and Joyce is, is the queen of metrics here. Uh, but uh, one metric that I think is, is really important before the announcement of your PPP and all the excitement that comes with it is what are our metrics for success? because that often galvanizes your commitment and makes it very clear what everyone's motivations are, or at least how you're gonna to work together. And having those clear at the outset, pre-announcement, because we all like to announce things here in DC, uh, it, uh, it, it really, really helps the quality and resilience of, of your partnership. So I would just leave it at those, those three lessons of what we've learned, and um, I can share with you the actual failures in private, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be talking about some of the challenges in, in a minute, but I just wanted to check if anyone yeah. else wanted to, to talk about metrics of, of success in your uh, experience. Thoughts, anyone, the queen of metrics? Well, I guess I would just say that um, you know, success uh, from the perspective of corporates may be quite different um, when we're talking about climate resiliency. So you know, often when I think about the measures that really should matter to the corporate sector, I might imagine that those would be the vulnerability measures, measures of health, habitat, water, infrastructure. But in fact, I think for most corporates, what keeps them up at night are measures of governance, uh, stability of governance, political stability, whether or not there's an educated workforce, uh, whether or not there is transparency in the rule of law. And so I think one of the big issues around public-private partnerships or around providing the proper metrics for a project that really helps not only measure success, but even drive where the project should be prioritizing its efforts, is to figure out how to combine these measures in a way that is easily accessible for the decision maker. And you know, I think that's something that all of us are um, really called to do if we, in fact, want to be the bridge or the hinge uh, between these sectors is to ask the question, well, what are the measures that really matter to you? 
uh, because it may be that while we think doing a climate resiliency project, the measure that they should care most about is water, for instance, what they may really care more about is whether or not there's any uh, sanctity of law that they can rely upon if they're going to bring their firm or uh, any of their assets to, to the arena. So. Great, thank you. Um, so you've highlighted already a little bit uh, some of the challenges. Um, diverse partners have different objectives, different metrics of success. Um, Maureen, um, I want to direct this question to you, um, not to put you on the spot, but um, in your experience, what are some of the biggest cultural differences, organizational cultural, for example, between diverse partners, private sector, government, academia, NGOs, and how, how, how can we bridge those? Oh, um, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's, um, I mean, there's even differences among corporate cultures. I mean, like consulting, I mean, we work at a very fast pace, mm -hmm. and I know that sometimes when we partner with NGOs, um, there's a, mis a bit of a, um, a mismatch. You know, we're trying to do pro bono work, and um, sometimes there's even like a resource, a resource barrier. They don't have um, administrative support, um, the same capacity that that we have. Um, there is. Sometimes there's a, an issue of preconceived notions, you know, and, and expectations when you walk into the room. Um, and I think that in order to overcome that, you know, it's just, it's all about engagement and, and developing relationships. You know, you need to, to build up trust to, to get over that and keep, keep the dialogue going. Great. Other thoughts? You know, I just um, wanted to perhaps take that question back to one of your four principles that you put forward in, in your introduction, David. Um, you were talking about the convergence of climate change and poverty reduction. I think that's a really important point um, from the perspective of um, culture. Uh, you know, so working in a lower income country, um, the minute you say climate, they might think you're talking about greenhouse gas reductions and feel quite put out that you're, in fact, not addressing issues that matter to them. And one of the, I think, really important things for us all to acknowledge is that climate resiliency has, um, in the lower income country or least developed country context, a much heavier overlap with poverty alleviation than it does with greenhouse gas mitigation. And in fact, that can actually really leverage a lot of our work in a very effective way because poverty alleviation and climate resiliency are very, very local. They deal with how we protect our families and how we protect our workforce and how we protect our homes and our capital assets for our businesses. And so I think the issue for those of us who are hoping to increase the amount of resiliency in lower income countries by bringing public-private partnerships to bear and especially by leveraging a lot of local assets is to acknowledge the um, poverty alleviation benefits of our work. Um, and in fact, also perhaps to just go into the marketplace there with the understanding that as the World Bank described in their two degrees report that came out about a year and a half ago now, many of the really important um, positives and, and traction that we've made, um, not, I don't mean we being uh, the you know, development community based in the United States and in um, and OECD countries, but the world has made on poverty redu reduction, we're actually stepping back on now due to climate change. And there's some, I think, quite chilling um, data out there that show that we, we are losing a lot of ground um, in our poverty alleviation goals as water constraints become more severe and thus civil strife is increased, for instance, or as food insecurity becomes a graver and graver threat in places like uh, the Sahel in Africa, which I think, you know, David, when you put um, smart agriculture on your list, um, you know, the minute I hear agriculture, I think water. Um, and I think water is one of those incredibly, um, uh, those assets that really, I think, are incredibly valuable for all of us to measure what, whatever sector we're in, because um, they're pretty much at the base of almost every value chain. Um, so that would be, if I had to guess or to vote on you know, where we expend resources in measuring for um, the culture uh, and measuring for the public-private partnership, I would, I would put them there. Great, thanks. Um, let's talk a little bit about information gaps. Um, that sometimes can be a challenge to taking action and bringing partners together if people have access to different types of information that might actually even be contradictory in some cases. Um, 
and yet we live in a world of a uh, constant stream of information. Uh, we know uh, what happens on cable TV um, with all those different levels of uh, feeds that go across the screen and drive me crazy. Um, and we know also about you know, the power of uh, big data, um, how when we go to our CVS store and we uh, swipe our card, they're tracking everything that we purchase and predicting what we might purchase in the future. Do we have enough information about um, what's happening related to climate change and resilience, enough information to be able to make decisions? Um, and if not, how can we resolve that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, the answer is yes, if we're creative. Um, so I think there are three things um, that really strike me about uh, the question of, of information or data, measurement indicators, and climate resiliency. The first is that um, we need to acknowledge that uh, all stakeholders, including corporate stakeholders, are um, users of that information. And if we keep it to ourselves at any particular government level, we are bound to have imperfect projects because they will be based on imperfect information. So I hear a lot of discussion earlier today um, and, and in other arenas about how the corporate sector is going to be really on the forefront of helping to improve um, you know, the world moving forward. Well, that will only be true if we have free and open source data uh, that they can access and also if we acknowledge them as a stakeholder in, uh, in, in data access. So, you know, we at the Global Adaptation Index um, at Notre Dame benefit greatly from the World Bank um, having very generously uh, several years ago opened up their data files. That was quite a moment for anyone interested in questions of um, humanitarian work and, and resiliency as well. And it has definitely led to a groundswell of more open data, but those data are generally at the country scale. So the challenge becomes, since climate change resiliency is very much a local issue, as I mentioned earlier, how do we get data that are comparable from region to region, city to city, even community to community? Um, and, and knowing that the corporate sector is a stakeholder in those data, um, how do we describe them in a way that uh, is palatable and easy for them to access? So I guess there, there are several issues embedded in there, but definitely understanding the corporate as a stakeholder and information is very important. Making sure that data are free and open source is very important. And, and then getting to the point, the story you're talking about here, David, around there's data all around us. Um, I think we're very encouraged by the idea that crowdsourced data could in fact be the next wave of much better decision making, much better informed decision making. Um, I used to work for the city of Chicago and was in charge of the climate action plan there. And what we used to say to one another um, with chagrin was the data, we with the data we need are the data we have. Because no government or very few governments have money for data gathering or data organizing or data publishing. So we really had to sort of limp along with what was available. And I think that's um, likely true for many of the regions that all of you work in um, overseas, uh, if you're working in lower income countries as well. So where are the data that exists that the country, that the government doesn't have to generate or share, but in fact, um, they exist because they're out there uh, through the crowd or the cloud. Uh, I think there's, there's more and more evidence that the private sector is harnessing these data. Um, and including also um, some really innovative nonprofits that act in private sector capacities, like Ushahidi, which uses crowdsourced data to identify areas um, having experienced the biggest uh, impacts after extreme events that then can uh, be used, those data can be used to target um, you know, quick response um, as one example. But um, I challenge anyone out here who's looking at innovation and how to work with the next generation of leaders and thinkers. Um, to really help us better understand how to access these freer uh, data sources that don't have such an imposition on governments um, to provide them to us. Other thoughts on data or information gaps? Michael? Sure. Um, we had a project in Jamaica. We were, we were working with the Jamaican government to design a national adaptation plan, which um, we were going to uh, fold into what was called their Vision 2020 plans, a national economic development plan. And we came in with USAID and we asked them what were your goals with respect to the Vision 2020. And part of that was to get um, uh, more information for local farmers. So there's a lot of coffee, just using coffee for one example in Jamaica that's grown. Um, so Jamaican coffee growers uh, wanted to know um, basically, what's the what is the rain what is the what does the rain and temperature uh, graphs look like for the next 
uh, two or three growing seasons. And in order to get that information, they would go to the Jamaican Meteorological Services. And when they went to the, to the Jamaican Meteorological Services, um, they said, well, where's the data? And they said, well, it's in a shed on a hill behind so-and-so's farm. So we literally went to this farm and went into the shed, and it was a soggy shack with piles and piles and piles of um, hand, hand table, handwritten tables. So these tables were on these pieces of paper that were about this wide and um, very, very long, you know, this, this almost continuously. And they were also taped together, so this tape was, and they were falling apart, they were soggy. So we had to figure out how were we gonna get this handwritten information that was falling apart into, a, basically into an Excel spreadsheet. So, and we needed it fast, so we actually found an organization in Africa that basically does this type of imaging, they have a, uh, this machine that they can feed, this, feed the paper through and takes pictures of these hand tables and then they can translate those images um, um, into numbers um, and then they created um, decades, this is not just one summer season, this is decades of data. They created uh, the first, um, they're calling it a climate services um, table for Jamaican farmers. Um, they created uh, um, this system for farmers to understand um, what the temperature is going to be like going forward. So I think the lesson there um, is that there are data gaps in places that are that you would think wouldn't occur, because Jamaica is somewhat developed with respect to some other developing countries. Um, and they are somewhat, their government's somewhat sophisticated, but to have some things in the shack um, is really surprising. So you gotta be nimble enough if you're running um, on full speed, like Maureen said, um, if you're running at full bore and, you have to, and you're stuck by, because there's a data gap, you have to be nimble enough to um, figure out a solution, or you can't answer the question. Um, so that's just one example. Great, yeah. very impressive. Um, let's move on to opportunities looking forward. Um, impact investing uh, is an area that has garnered a lot of attention lately. Um, Robert, I'm wondering, uh, just given your experience, how effective of a mechanism or tool do you think it is for building partnerships to address climate change and resilience? Well, the term impact investing certainly gets people's attention and gets them to the table. Uh, I think impact investing uh, offers a lot of hope because you're bringing people that are motivated with their capital uh, to the point where they could make a decision and get informed. Uh, oftentimes it suffers from the, the, what I call the, the phenomenon of everyone wanting to be the second first investor. Uh, it, it just seems like that, that happens again and again. So I, for, in our experience, yes, the impact investing community has been very, very supportive, especially those that are really thinking from a systems change level. Uh, how do we build the field to create a healthier impact investing ecosystem? And, and public-private partnerships are part of that. Uh, getting the right data and being informed and getting down in the weeds and really understanding a discrete system, I think it is helpful because then you could start to implement the sort of rigor that is required for an investment vis-a-vis uh, -vis getting people very excited about some high-level concepts and how do we come together and, and join the force and, and actually be part of a movement. Um, having the tangible wins on the ground with measurable successes, as I was saying earlier, uh, is, is a big part of that. And the impact investments that I have seen that have worked, that, that I think are especially interesting, are ones that, that actually do deal with those, those sort of, of concrete measurements. Great, thank you. Maureen, I'm gonna direct uh, uh, my last question to you and I'll ask others to comment. Um, much is expected of the private sector these days. We hear a lot of attention being given to it. I think we heard it earlier at, at lunch and, and some of the other panels. Um, sometimes private sector is seen as sort of the opportunity for uh, s s uh, scaling or sustainability, um, uh, sort of replacing the grant mechanism that uh, those of us in the NGO world are, are quite familiar with. Is this realistic? Um, and what are the implications of that for corporate partners? Um, well, there's no panacea, but I think that uh, corporates can be instigators. Um, you know, related to climate change, a lot of us know what a problem, you know, beef is. Um, and so an example 
that comes to mind is, you know, McDonald's made this claim that by 2016 they're going to have sustainable beef. <laughs> but what's sustainable beef? They didn't even know. Um, but they made the claim anyways. Um, and good on them. And so, but what are they going to do? Stop serving hamburgers? Um, but the sustainability drivers aren't going to go away, go away either. So they need to come up with a definition of sustainable beef. Um, and I think that they're doing two things that are putting them on the path to success. They are taking a you know, multi-stakeholder approach um, and they're measuring what matters. So you know, they're coming to the table with you know, naturally people in their value chain and you know, the beef industry and the global round table for sustainable beef. And then also they're coming to the table with people that they might not want to normally talk to, you know, NGOs and um, World Wildlife Fund, um, and you know, to have an open dialogue. And then secondly, they are using a life cycle approach to understand what sustainable beef might actually look like. And um, you know, they engage Deloitte to do a life cycle analysis. Um, uh, engagement to look and see what that might look like. And I think going forward, another opportunity, we had a conversation this morning um, about, you know, roles. Somebody said that they were really good at sitting in long meetings. Um, <laughs> and I could see in the future that uh, a future step for bringing in governments and other NGOs because Sometimes businesses move a little bit faster than the regulatory environment, but I imagine that, you know, that will come in. Oh, and by the way, Walmart jumped in, and now they want sustainable beef by 2020. So this is scaling up. I mean, this is going to be a huge impact because think about the value chain of how much beef is going to be bought according to this new label. Um, so I think this is a, a role you know, that will make an impact. Um, hopefully everything works out. Great examples. Other concluding thoughts on this question? Joyce? David, if I may just, um, you know, I think one thing from Notre Dame Global Adaptation Index's perspective is that we're really quite um, thrilled, I would use the word, at the, uh, the impact that corporations are trying to make in the resiliency space. Um, every year we hold a corporate adaptation prize uh, competition and it's judged by external stakeholders. Um, this year we had over 30 countries represented and, and several dozen applications and they ranged from you know really innovative um, technologies that BASF is uh, promulgating in Latin America to increase the uh, water absorptive capacity of soil to Abbott doing interesting work with increasing um, nutrient value in, uh, in Haiti through their Nori Mamba uh, initiative. Ingevity had a really very strong application for your 30 country project. Um, our winner was Novartis uh, for work that they're doing to, uh, that's totally based on a return on investment. It's not a philanthropic um, investment at all, to shore up healthy families in India um, by providing them with access to medical um, information and also pharmaceuticals. Um, and we also had uh, some winner from um, Senegal who's working on um, coastal zone erosion that's increasing tourism and uh, takes for fisheries. So I think the, the issue here for us is that a lot of the innovation in resiliency has to do with unveiling the risk. Because for corporations, known risk spells opportunity. It's unknown risk that they want to move away from. And it really comes back for us then to this question of information, because if we can help them to elucidate what the risks are, um, we think that we have a much better chance of getting them to invest to um, not only shore up their own bottom line and increase uh, their return on investment, but also make a big difference. And I'll just end with a couple of quick anecdotes that the very same set of data that helps Catholic Relief Services to determine you know, where you might prioritize some of your resiliency initiatives coming out of the Global Adaptation Index is also used by Morgan Stanley in their advising to their high net worth individuals. Now, those individuals are looking for countries like Rwanda 
or Kajikistan, which according to the 2013 release of the ND Gain Country Index, have shown remarkable increases in resiliency or adaptive capacity over the course of the last 10 years, much more significant increases than their peers. And it's those sorts of anomalies that investors are trying to glom onto to be the first into a marketplace to try to make a buck. Um, we're glad they might be going in there to make a buck in, in the event that it's about really to in, you know, increasing economic, social governance, and especially uh, uh, you know, anything to do with decreasing vulnerability. So I think that that's another reason why we're eager to apply uh, data so that we can really see more and more of these innovations coming into the resiliency space. If I could, I'd like to share a story about data and, and rainforest conservation. So I think it illustrates the power of data to make change, which is a, a big part of what we're trying to do, especially your work. You're informing stakeholders of how they can incorporate this to move on. And oftentimes, uh, and I know everything, I've, I haven't given you a concrete example yet. I've talked very abstractly, so I'd like to kind of bring this down. But uh, there, there, is, there are discrete opportunities that I think are really inspiring when good data is presented to decision makers. And uh, I was actually sitting down with the former head of Greenpeace Brazil a few months back, and he was telling me that they did a, a whole body of research on the sawmills in the Amazon. And what they found was that 72% of the biomass that's cut down in lumber gets churned into sawdust. And very little ends up actually in the lumber board that gets shipped all over the world. Um, and they compiled all this information, uh, he took it, it took him a year to do the study, brought it to the Minister of the Environment, and he said, look, we need to change this. We need to figure out a way to get these, uh, these companies more efficient uh, saw equipment. And uh, the minister looked at the data and said, Marcelo, get out of my office. You, know, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, two years later, he gets a call, and Marcelo comes in. And he says, Marcelo, you were dead wrong. It wasn't 72%. It was 72.3%. <laughs> and uh, he went on to create a, a loan loss reserve program through the Brazilian National Bank to get state-of-the-art sawmill equipment throughout the Amazon. And there's a big, big benefit there. And when you have that powerful data, you present it in an intelligent, thoughtful way to the appropriate stakeholder, you could have radical transformation. And I think, as a result, you have a very pro-business approach to a less intensive way to do your, um, your silviculture. Great concluding thought. I think we have about five to seven minutes left for some questions. Um, and uh, we have someone with a mic who's going to go around. It's the end of the afternoon. <laughs> All right. Uh, I have a question on, on the. Um efficient uh, saw milling equipment yeah. uh, that is there. Did that, did that actually uh, influence the market price of, of lumber in Brazil? I, I don't know. I don't want to tell you more than I know. Uh, I, I, I do know that it influenced the, the cost of getting new sawmill equipment if you were a sawmill. It did do that, but I, I don't know what else, what other benefits it had. Other questions? All right, right over here. Thank you. I'm Andy Reynolds at the State Department. This is actually for Joyce, uh, where you said the free and open source data is vital to the, the generation. This speaks to the entire revolution in ICTs and internet, big data, fast applications and the entrepreneurship that we're seeing uh, in open source and as you went to crowdsourcing. The only thing I'd say is what's your experience in looking at official data collection as opposed to crowdsourcing, which is a, an unknown, it's terra incognita at this time. So there may be some contention between governments who are saying, no, that we're not accepting that data as a crowd, crowdsource data system. But it seems to me the overwhelming odds will be toward using more data for more fidelity. And the, the speed is, of course, everything, as you've pointed out, especially when you need rapid response in certain situations. So can you just move a bit further into that space where I couldn't be more enthusiastic about the way metrics mm -hmm. has been a common theme all day. Metrics are so important. 
and data collection as part of metrics and measuring our public policy responsibilities and our, and our results and outcomes. Thank That's you. a great question, Andy. I, I can't give you an example that actually compares the uh, verifiable government data versus the crowdsource because we're not yet using the crowdsource. But I will say this, that um, to a person that uses the Global Adaptation Index, they ask, are these data verified? And so if they're asking that about our data, which generally come from the World Bank and are thus probably lagging by about 18 months, which is not a dig on the World Bank, it's just how it works when you're gathering data at the country scale. Um, what will they say when we bring them a set of data that are from SMS text that suggests that there might have been some sort of a drought impact that's causing you know, a migration of a population that could impact you know, the, the commodities market in whatever, right? I mean, that's going to be a very hard sell but on the other hand, um, they, I think many corporations deal in imperfect, I, and by the way, I don't mean to only use corporate examples, but I'm going with another one here. Many corporations are using imperfect information anyway, and they're eager for someone to aggregate other sets of data as long as we say to them, these are not comparable necessarily across time or across geographies, or there's a, these are the sets of missing values. Um, I think the idea is, especially as metrics become more of a sexy topic, people are also becoming much more aware of what they should be watching out for, which is great. And they're asking significant questions, including of indices, by the way. I mean, indices are meant to be really a weather report, not a thermometer. They're supposed to help all of us that are trying to make decisions to know where to test our own assumptions and what to look into further. They're not intended to be the decision-making tool. Um, but I think that they will get better when they use more of these quick response sets of data, and I'm eager to try it. And I hope that by 18 months from now, I can give you an answer that says, well, this was how hard we failed, and this is what really worked for us. Because there's a lot of lessons to be learned, I'm sure. There's the Wikipedia analogy, right? Mm -hmm. Right. The comparison of Wikipedia and some established right. you know, encyclopedia, and it was like 96% valid. Oh, that's a great, I'm going to use that one next time. Use that, in your, <laughs> use that in yourself. I will. Uh, that's good. All right, well, I think we'll just try and wrap up there. Um, I'd like to thank all the panelists for all their stimulating ideas, examples, and thoughts on this. And uh, I learned a lot today. I hope you did, too.